Welcome to every single nursing member joining this session today. To say that I don't get starstruck at my age is a bit of an understatement, but I'm not afraid to say that I'm totally starstruck today. And I'm more than a tad nervous. Um, why, you might ask? Because I have the honour of introducing this man, Professor Sir Michael Mormont. Sir Michael is here to present on his most recent work, the Build Back Ferrer Report, that emphasizes the social determinants of health. Now, Sir Michael won't remember me, but once you read Sir Michael's work or have the privilege of being in his professional company, you never forget him. I first came across Sir Michael and his work whilst working as a public health nurse in the Public Health Agency in Northern Ireland. I became acquainted with his work and the man when we were playing our part in establishing the All-Ireland Institute of Public Health. When Sir Michael reminded us on many occasions that health inequalities and the social determinants of health don't change just because of artificial borders north and south of the island of Ireland. Today I don't have time colleagues to tell you of the achievements of Sir Michael. That would take up the full allotted time. So I suggest that you look at the Institute of Health Equity, University College London, Department of Epidemiology and Public Health and there you will find out about Sir Michael and his work. But if you want to know really his impact, read what Paul Cullen, no plug intended, said about Sir Michael in the Irish Times. He said, Sir Michael has spent his career trying to break down the barriers of health equality, and he believes it should be a main priority for governments. He went on to say, money doesn't buy happiness, but the clear evidence is that it does buy you extra years of life. The flip side of this is, of course, is that the poor experience the worst health outcomes and the shortest life expectancies. He also said, tackling this massive health inequality should be a main priority of governments because of the ethical issues involved. Sir Michael has devoted his working life to the issue. Sir Michael went on to say, there's an intimate relationship between where you are on the social hierarchy and your health. The people at the top have the longest life, he says. Those in the middle are shorter. And as you get lower and lower, the life expectancy gets shorter and shorter. Sir Michael's research has detailed the social gradient affecting the length of all our lives, according to where we are on the economic pecking order. In a 2010 report for the Labour government in the UK, he found that the people living in the poorest neighbourhoods died seven years earlier on average than those in the wealthiest neighbourhoods. Mormont believes all government policies should be proofed for their impact on health inequality. He said, we should have a health equity lens trained on all social and economic policy, asking what's the likely impact on health equity of trends in health equality. Let's not just look at debt and deficits, he says, but at the impact on people's lives of government decisions and on health equity. And if the Minister for Finance says, you're being unrealistic, I say, sorry mate, we don't have the luxury of not doing that. Paul Cullen of the Irish Times says that Sir Michael lapsed just briefly into his Australian accent of his youth at this point. Born in England, Sir Michael moved to Australian childhood and qualified as a medical doctor in Sydney. In the 1980s, he led groundbreaking research which identified a correlation between life expectancy and social status among British civil servants. A former president of the British Medical Association, he chaired a, chaired a World Health Organization Commission on Social Determinants of Health from 2005 to 2008, and he has won numerous awards for his work in public health. In the UK Review, he set out six areas he believes governments need to develop policies to improve health equity. Early childhood development, education, employment, minimum incomes for healthy living, healthy neighbourhoods, and social determinant approach to prevention on issues such as smoking and obesity. Critics have objected that people can control their own health destinies by, for example, quitting smoking or eating better. But Sir Michael says he has no time for the personal responsibility arguments. He said, I've been hearing that for a very long time, and I would say it's contradicted by the evidence. While it is true that poorer people are more likely to smoke, there is no evidence that they are being more irresponsible, he argues. 
He cites research by scientists at Harvard and Princeton, which asked whether people were poor because they were irresponsible or were irresponsible as a result of poverty. It is poverty which makes it difficult for people to juggle complex decisions, he said. And then he went on to say, they're saying, I've got enough problems. I'm trying to make ends meet. I'm trying to feed them anything, let alone look after their health. Ultimately, Sir Michael would like all of us to look differently at health because he says it is different. He said, I don't think there's a strong ethical case about, say, the car that people drive but there is a strong ethical case about access to healthcare. So without much further ado, I'm honored to hand you over to Professor Sir Michael Mormont to present his work. And afterwards I'll take questions from yourselves, which I encourage you to post in the Q&A chat. Thank you. Thank you. And it is a pleasure to join you this morning. I'm feeling upbeat, uh, a politician, that I have advised, who spent time as foreign minister, now in the prime minister's chair, uh, has really listened. Unfortunately, he's the prime minister of Norway, uh, not the prime minister of the UK, but if one prime minister can do it, maybe we can follow the lead of Norway. That would be good, because this is a very important moment, which is why I called my report and this talk this morning, Build Back Fairer. We do not want to reestablish the status quo. The opening line of my book, The Health Gap, was why treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick. And that's a challenge for nurses as it is for other medical professionals. Uh, you work in the healthcare system how to deal with the issues that make people sick. When I was president of the World Medical Association, we produced a report on doctors for health equity. We said five things doctors could do and medical associations, education and training, seeing the individual in a broader perspective, the health sector as employer, we would now generalize it and think about anchor institutions in healthcare, working in partnership and advocates. And there's now been a similar report produced for nurses based on this line. So what I'm going to talk about now is really how the nursing profession can get involved in all five of these. So I'm not going to talk specifically about nurses, but about the issues. And in fact, I'm going to talk about two reports that we gave the title, Build Back Fairer. The Commission on Social Determinants of Health in the Eastern Mediterranean region of WHO. We published it in March 2021. And they saw the title of our English Build Back Fair report and said, we want the same title in the Eastern Mediterranean. We need to build back fair. And then the Build Back Fair, the COVID-19 Marmot Review. So let's start with the Eastern Mediterranean one. This was our conceptual framework. And although I'm talking about North Africa and the Middle East, the same issues apply to the United Kingdom, to European countries. We have structural drivers, conflict and consequences, economic and commercial drivers, culture and society, the natural environment, and then the conditions of daily life, maternal and child health, early years and education, employment and quality of work, healthy aging, built environment, health systems. We're particularly concerned in the Middle East with position of migrants, refugees, and gender. And we had as a principle, do something, do more, do better as principles of action. And I'll illustrate what I mean by that. Governance and political cultures, policies, and the importance of research and monitoring. monitoring. And the outcome is health equity and dignified lives. This is the so-called Eastern Mediterranean region of WHO. It stretches from Morocco at the very west of the Mediterranean 
through North Africa, the Middle East, Somalia, Djibouti, and then Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, sportingly known as the Eastern Mediterranean. If we look at gross national income per person of countries, we see the familiar Preston curve at low levels of national income. A small increase in national income is associated with a big increase in life expectancy. It's plausible that if the income of Afghanistan increased to that of Pakistan, life expectancy might get a bit higher, like Pakistan. If Pakistan's income improved to that of Egypt, life expectancy might well improve. But when you get up here, Jordan, Lebanon's in real trouble, Iran, and go all the way out to Qatar with a national income per person of more than $90,000 adjusting for purchasing power. There's simply no relation between national income and life expectancy. Getting richer as a country, once you get to this fifteen to $20,000 national income per person, getting richer as a country is not the way to getting healthier. Focus on the social determinants of health. And then we have big inequalities within countries, a social gradient that looks very similar to the kinds of social gradients that we see in the UK and that I will show you. Under five mortality, very clear. So it's all at a much higher level in Pakistan, but the lower the wealth quintile, the higher the mortality. And the implications, and I'll come back to that talking about the UK, the implications are that we should focus not only on poverty, but we want to get everybody up to the level of the best off. We need to focus on the gradient. I said our principles of action would do something, do more, do better. Do something. Sudan, Afghanistan. We're talking about fewer than 40%, 45% of people have access to basic sanitation. Yemen, do something. Get everybody up to the world average or better still, to Iran or the occupied Palestinian territories, the UAR, of basic sanitation. Do something. You can make a real difference to people in real poverty. Do more. The percent of women who agree that a husband is justified in hitting his wife in Afghanistan more than 60% of women with higher education agree to that proposition. In Morocco, Yemen, you see this clear relation with education. One of the issues we had to confront in the Eastern Mediterranean region is people said, well, it's culture. Women are treated differently in these cultures. And our response was to say, yes, culture is very important, but the human right of a woman to be treated with dignity and not to be beaten by a husband surely trumps culture. And you can see it with education. The more educated the woman, the less likely she is to endorse this proposition. And when I say do something, do more, do better, you need to do more at the same time you're doing something. You can't say, yes, let's forget about this issue until everyone's got sanitation. You need to pay attention to sanitation and the right of a woman to live a life of dignity, free of fear of physical abuse. Do better. 
tax loss to corporate tax abuse. I could be talking about the United Kingdom. In Egypt, $2 billion lost annually to corporate tax abuse. Pakistan, two and a half billion. Saudi Arabia, two and a quarter billion. UAR, a billion dollars. Do better. Think of the sanitation. Think of the education. Think of the nurses you could employ if you could recover that tax from corporations. Structural drivers. I don't need, I think, to remind you that half the 22 countries and territories in this region have conflict, either just have it, have it now, or are about to have conflict. And it has huge consequences. This is the number of refugees living in Jordan, nearly 3 million, with huge consequences for the refugees themselves, and of course, for the state of Jordan, occupied Palestinian territory, Lebanon. Huge toll on the host country as well as on the refugees. Economic and commercial determinants, culture and society. We had lots to say about these, but I don't want to distract us this morning. The natural environment. Now, that's challenging. In a region of the world, most of whose wealth comes from fossil fuels. We're talking about net zero greenhouse gas emissions. Look at this. Share of benefits from electricity subsidies in Iran, Jordan and Lebanon. The richer you are, the greater the share of electricity subsidies. So the rich are being subsidized to use more electricity, which means more fossil fuels. Something terribly wrong here. We've got to deal with the climate crisis and we've got to deal with poverty at the same time, not subsidize rich people to consume more electricity. And then there's the conditions of daily life. And of course, COVID-19 has impact in the region forecast of extreme poverty in the Middle East, North African region, the pre-COVID projection, poverty was due to go down, and the impact of COVID-19 on increasing poverty. The percent of workers who stop working by wealth quintile. So these are very similar problems to the problems we have in the UK. And then I come to our first Build Back Fair report, the COVID-19 Marmot Review. And to put that in context, I have to talk about our 10 year on review. In February 2020, last year, we published Health Equity in England, the Marmot Review 10 years on. We went back to the original Marmot Review Fair Society Healthy Lives, published in 2010, where we'd made a set of recommendations on what government could and should do to reduce health inequalities. So literally on the 10 year anniversary, February 2020, we looked at the Marmot Review 10 years on what had happened. And the answer was we lost a decade and it shows. Life expectancy had been improving about one year every four years for women and for men. And in 2010-11, there was a break in the curve. That rate of improvement slowed dramatically and just about ground to a halt. What happened in 2010? We had a new government elected, a conservative-led coalition government. They said, surely... You couldn't be suggesting that anything we did led to this slowdown in health improvement. Well, we need to look at it. You pursued a set of policies. You must have assumed those policies would have some effect. Maybe this was one of the effects. Perhaps came the counter. We've just reached 
peak life expectancy. It's got to slow down sometime. So we looked at other countries. This is annual life expectancy improvement in weeks. Estonia, Norway, Slovakia, Hungary, Denmark, Belgium, Austria, all of these countries had more rapid improvement in life expectancy than did the UK. The only big countries, the only rich countries with slower improvement were Iceland and the United States. In the 2010 Marmot Review, we had six domains of recommendations. Give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, fair employment and good work for all, healthy standard of living, everyone should have at least the minimum income necessary for a healthy life, healthy and sustainable places in which to live and work, and taking a social determinants approach to prevention. What do I mean by that? The a people's ability, as was said in the introduction, to pursue healthy lives is very much influenced by their social circumstances. So what happened in 2010? The government that was elected had, as their stated objective, their mission was to roll back the state to reduce public expenditure. And they did it. They were successful. In 2009, 10, 42% of GDP went in public expenditure. That went down year on year. So by 2018-19, the 42% had become 35%. They did it. They rolled back the state. In my 2010 review, we coined the phrase proportionate universalism. The whole idea was we wanted universal policies with effort proportionate to need. Here's the social gradient, let's say less deprivation. And we want to level up. Have you heard that phrase, leveling up? Effort proportionate to need. Universalist policies with effort proportionate to need. What did we get after 2010? This is spending per person by local authority, by level of deprivation. So in the least deprived, 20% of areas, spending went down by 16%. The greater the deprivation, the greater the reduction. In the most deprived, 20%, it went down by 32%. There's a lot of talk about social care, adult social care spending went down by 3% in the least deprived and went down by 16% in the most deprived. Remember, proportionate universalism said universalist policies with effort proportionate to need. Here we've got effort inversely proportionate to need. The greater the deprivation, the greater the need, the greater the need, the greater the reduction in spending. Could this have contributed to worsening health and increased inequalities? Yeah, I think it could. So what happened to various policies? Here's child poverty defined as living in a household at less than 60% median income before housing costs. Child poverty was around 18% in 2010. After housing costs, it was 27%. And over the decade, that 27% went up to 30%. Child poverty went up. I waited 10 years to do the Marmot Review 10 years on. I waited only 10 months to look at the impact of the pandemic. Here's the social gradient in all-cause mortality. And here's the social gradient in COVID-19 mortality. It looks very similar. It means that the causes 
of inequalities in COVID-19 are very similar to the causes of inequalities in health more generally. The effect of the pandemic was to expose and amplify underlying inequalities. And here's an example of amplification, looking at ethnic group, black African, women and men compared to white, astonishingly high mortality from COVID-19, Bangladeshi, black Caribbean, Pakistani, and to a lesser extent, Indian. Much of that excess can be attributed to geography, where people live, crowding, deprivation, other socioeconomic characteristics. Interestingly, for Black African and Black Caribbean, not much can be attributed to prior ill health, although quite a bit can in Bangladeshi and Pakistani. We need to address the issue of structural racism. To what extent does that provide an explanation for this pattern? What I haven't shown you, but was dramatic, was that the I showed you the social gradient in mortality over the decade prior to the pandemic, that social gradient got steeper, inequalities increased. And in fact, in the poorest decile outside London, life expectancy went down. And that slowdown in life expectancy, you remember, was nearly the slowest of rich countries. Only Iceland and the United States had a slower improvement. So that's where we were, stalling life expectancy, increased inequality, health for the poorest people getting worse before the pandemic. And then during the pandemic, we had the highest excess mortality of any rich country in the first half year. And uh, now we're right up there near the top of excess mortality. And I asked myself, what's the link between where we were pre-pandemic and our poor management of the pandemic. And I think that link could work at four levels, poor governance and political culture, increasing social and economic inequalities, the reduction in spending on public services. We were ill-prepared coming into the pandemic and we were unhealthy. So, if you agree with me that health is a measure of societal success and health inequalities are a measure of inequalities in social progress, then we need to address health inequalities as fundamental to building back fairer. We need to pay attention to my six domains Give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, fair employment and good work for all, having enough money to live on. That should mean not reducing universal credit to make poor people poorer, healthy and sustainable places and communities, and taking a social determinants approach to prevention. But we also need to work at a different level. We need to address the problems of poor governance and political culture. We need to address the social and economic inequalities that have been increasing. It's not enough to say austerity is over and make no further cuts. We need to reverse the cuts that have been made to reinvest in our public services, to create better lives for people, following the principles of proportionate universalism. And we need, of course, to address the fact that we weren't very healthy. And my argument is that we need to put a fair distribution of health and well-being at the heart of all government policy. So thank you, Professor Sir Michael, um, for that um, again um, an incredible presentation 
Now, we could be here for the next um, number of hours with the questions we've got, but we're, um, I'm going to start with a few questions, I think, that um, sum up really the, the response to your presentation. And the first one is from BJ Walthall. And BJ asks, um, Sir Michael, funds are limited. So where would you invest money to make the biggest impact? Healthcare, environment, education, improve living wage infrastructure. The, my, I've always resisted the idea that we should do one thing. Uh, we need a properly funded healthcare system, no question. So we, people ask me, would you take money away from the healthcare system uh, to fund these other things? No, of course not. Uh, we need a properly funded healthcare system. But that doesn't mean we should neglect social care. The fact that we need to pay nurses properly doesn't mean that we should pay a pittance to people working in adult social care or that teachers shouldn't be paid properly uh, or that we should not have proper ventilation in classrooms so it's safe for kids to go to school. We're a rich country. We can do all of the things you just mentioned, and we have to do all the things. We do them already. We just do them poorly. Um, we need to do all the things. We could stop corporate tax abuse. That would make a difference. <laughs> corporate tax, you remember that lie that was on the side of the big double-decker bus about the 350 million pounds a week we sent to Brussels? That was a lie. Um, but if you looked at the amount that we lost, lose each year in corporate tax abuse, because Starbucks and Google's and the Google and the like don't pay proper taxes in Britain, we could do a lot more. This is quite apart from having a properly progressive taxation system. So no, we don't have to make those difficult choices. We have money, and can I say? My latest bit of learning, uh, a bon mot from John Maynard Keynes. Um, during the war, Keynes said, anything we can do, we can afford. Just reflect on that. Anything we can do, we can afford. In other words, austerity was a political choice. It wasn't a necessity. Um, the government decided they did not want to do a lot of things. They did not want to fund adult social care. They wanted to reduce the spending on education by 8% per pupil. They wanted to do that. Anything we can do, we can afford. Thank you, Sir Michael. The next question is from Charlotte McArdle. And Charlotte asks, she, she references a Nurses for Health Equity report that advocates investment in nurses to address the social determinants of health. How can nurses articulate the links between workforce and inequality to influence investment? Well, when I was going through the five areas that were in the medical report, and the nurses report, um, as I said, is on, along similar lines, and I talked about anchor institutions, uh, the idea that the health care system has potentially a huge impact on the community. It employs people, nurses, crucial employees, um, and if nurses don't have proper recompense for the vital work they do, that has impact not just on individual nurses, it has impact on the community. I mean, paying people a living wage is good for them and it's good for the whole society and economy. Um, it makes no sense to pay people so they don't have enough to live on because they can't buy things, they can't buy food, they can't heat their homes, they can't get shoes for their children. Um, it makes no sense. So um, paying nurses properly and having nurses as advocates for everyone in the system to be paid properly um, 
It's part of a much more fundamental change of who we value in society. When talking about Build Back Fair and saying the pandemic, a lot of people have made this point, should have taught us some lessons. And the question is, did we have our minds open enough to learn those lessons that we value delivery drivers? We value our refuse collectors. Um, we value people who keep society running. Uh, and of course, nurses are vital in that, but so are workers in social care. And are we going, if we value them, are we going to give them the recompense necessary to lead a life of dignity? Thank you, Mr. Michael. Um, wouldn't argue with anything you've said there. The next question is, Sally Sylvie says, um, given this is a global matter, what is the impact that wealthier nations have on political ideology? Interesting. It's a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, I, let me speculate. Um, and so it means we're having, you know, I like to talk from facts and evidence. So if I'm speculating, it means ignore everything because I haven't got the evidence. But it's Franklin Delano Roosevelt ushered in an approach to economics and policy. Um, John Maynard Keynes, who I quoted, was the economics guru of that whole era. And the Roosevelt era, that way of thinking, lasted from 1932, 33, whenever he started, 33, until around 1979-80 and that influenced political ideology for the whole world as a liberal social democracy and then with Thatcher and Reagan and the neoliberal era so that more than 40 year Roosevelt era became a liberal a neoliberal era uh, the World Bank, the Washington Consensus, the IMF, structural adjustment. Um, the IMF was going around the world imposing a political economic ideology on the whole world. You've got to, um, free markets, don't subsept, it doesn't matter if people starve. Um, they told me in Zambia, I, they used to call the IMF the infant mortality fund because after the IMF had been in Zambia, infant mortality went mm -hmm. up because of the damage they did. And this was the ideology. And it's under threat, that ideology. It's under threat. And we may just be ready for another revolution. I don't, don't mean a Marxist revolution. I mean uh, an intellectual revolution uh, in, in thinking for perhaps rediscovering what's best about liberal democracies. Um, I mean, the right-wing populist reaction is one reaction to the problem of neoliberalism. It's unfortunately a very damaging one. Um, but we may just be ready for another uh, dramatic change in thinking that will affect the whole world. And I would like to think that the learning will go in several directions. We won't just be rich countries imposing a model on low and middle income countries, but we'll have some mutual learning. Thank you. We have time for a few more questions, um, Sir Michael. Jean Stephen has said, in relation to healthy aging, the triple lock on pensions has stopped this year. What impact do you think this will have on older people? Yeah, it's very interesting that um, two things. One is that with austerity, uh, the triple lock meant that poverty went from older people to families with children. Uh, so you could see that working age families with children, there was, as a result of changes to the tax and benefit system, there was an a, a stark drop in income that was regressive. The poorer you were, 
the bigger the drop in income as a result of changes to the tax and benefit system. So the triple lock in, in pensions protected the income of older people. I, I mean, I'm sure it's a complete coincidence that older people are more likely to vote than younger people and more likely to vote conservative than younger people. That's obviously wasn't the reason the government did it. Um, complete I'm being ironic. Um, and what we don't want is to go back to pensioner poverty um, to have a shift in the distribution of poverty from families and young children back up to pensioners. We want to retain the living standards of the older people because being poorer in older age will damage your health, um, no question. So we don't want to do that. Um, what we need to do is actually improve the living standards of working age families with children without compromising the living standards of people beyond working age. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Uh, and Mary O'Connor asks, what would you like to change tomorrow if you had a magic wand? I would like to, I'd like the Prime Minister of Norway. Um, <laughs> I would like to, so let, let me tell you a story about him. When he was foreign minister, he said that I am a health minister. Every minister is a health minister because what we do in our day job impacts on health. And a, a colleague who worked in uh, the, the government, civil servant in Norway, she said, you know, you've been going around the world. She rang me. And she said, you know, you've been going around the world quoting our foreign minister saying that he is a health minister. He now is our health minister and he'd like to meet you. So I went to Oslo and I met him. We had a good meeting. And I then had a meeting with senior civil servants uh, from 13 different government departments. Uh, and so he was the health, the, the foreign minister, he's now the health minister, he was then the health minister, he's now going to be the prime minister. And the big change, and I hope he does this as prime minister, is to look at the impact that every department has on the distribution of health and well-being of the population. So the big change that I would like to see tomorrow is from tomorrow that the question would not be the Treasury wants you to find cuts in your department, but the Prime Minister wants you to look at the impact on the distribution of health and well-being of everything your department does, whether it's the Home Office or housing communities and local government, whether it's levelling up um, environment, trade, whatever it is, we want to look at the distribution of health and well-being of the whole of government. So I'm going to take Chair's licence and ask um, maybe just one more question, if that's okay, Sir Michael, now that we've got you in our company. And it's from Denise Kelly. And Denise starts off by saying, what a powerful presentation from Sir Michael. Healthcare is a political choice, Denise says. How can we influence this positively for healthcare staff and our patients? Well, you notice that I'm talking mainly about issues other than healthcare. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about how we organize society. Um, but healthcare is vital. And in response to an earlier question, I said, I would never say, reduce investment in the health care system. It's vital, uh, but we need to do all the other things. I mean, I, 
you notice that I said the out outcome in the Eastern Mediterranean Commission was health equity and dignified lives. Um, recognizing that the dignity of our patients and the dignity of the staff uh, who work with those patients um, is absolutely vital. Um, dignified lives. Uh, you've heard me say before uh, how nurses come out as the number one professional group when it comes to trust by the public. And it's a trust that's well earned. Um, it's right because of who nurses are and what they do. And for nurses to do the vital work they do, they need to be treated with dignity as patients expect to be treated with dignity by those same people. It means having that value go right through the system. Absolutely excellent. Sir Michael, thank you so, so much for being in the company of our nurses today. Thank you for a very thought provoking presentation and for every single report that you have written that's impacted um, on certainly every um, public health nurse's life and their practice, um, but equally on um, the wider society. Uh, it's an absolute privilege to be with you. It's a privilege to read your work and it's a privilege to have you speak at um, our education sessions of, of our Congress. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.